Good morning, everyone. Uh, so this is my great honor to introduce today's first speaker, Dr. Damianos Kokinidis, uh, who, after graduating from the University of Thess Un Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Greece, he moved to the United States. First, he did a research year at the Denver VA Medical Center, University of Colorado. Then he did uh, did a residency in New York at the Jacoby Medical Center, where he did win uh, numerous teaching awards, uh, including the, the Leo David Alf uh, Teaching Award. And uh, after that, we were lucky enough to recruit him to our cardiology fellowship. He's going to graduate this year. And uh, after this, he will uh, start as an attending at the Lawrence Memorial Hospital. So thank you, Damianos, for presenting and take it away. Thank you, Dr. Feher, and uh, thank you, everybody, for being here today. And I would also like to thank the uh, Cardiology fellow Fellowship Leadership, but also the Section Leadership for um, giving us the opportunity to present um, on the grand rounds. My topic today will be uh, the importance of um, ischemic ECG changes and coronary artery calcification in decision making and prognosis in the modern uh, spectra. Uh, no disclosures. Um, those are the goals of the presentation today, and um, I'm going to start talking about the first one, which is uh, to review uh, the clinically and prognostically important information that we can obtain from myocardial perfusion imaging. Uh, which obviously, apart from just knowing whether it's ischemia, scar, or normal perfusion, we can get additional information, including information on the ventricular function, the volume, the response of the heart rate and blood pressure to exercise and recovery, um, information about the stress modality that is being picked also which independently of everything else is very important in terms of prognosis. Uh, we can also obtain information about patient symptoms and all that stuff in general, they affect the prognosis. Now, what I think is very interesting to realize is that only the modality that someone is undergoing and whether someone is having a regadenos and pharmacological version exercise pack uh, by itself is associated with the outcomes. And obviously, this is like there are a lot of confounders here because all the risk factors that someone might have or all the comorbidities that someone might have that make them not a great candidate for an exercise spec by themselves um, confound this association and basically lead to like in the long term, uh, they're associated with worse outcomes. Um, now, the second goal of the presentation is to overview the importance of ischemic ST changes in SPECT um, with um, normal perfusion. And in order to do that, I'm going to um, like make a brief journey back to my second year of fellowship. And um, we had our, um, you know, I was a nuclear. It was uh, me, uh, Phil, who was one of the third year fellows last year, and um, uh, Dr. Attila Feher, uh, who was an uh, advanced imaging fellow last year. So we were on our nuclear rotation. And, you know, Typically, on, um, in the Nuclear Journal Club, there are nuclear um, topics presented, but that day we were discussing this paper uh, by Duke and our chief, Dr. Velasquez, was the last author in that, um, which actually focuses on the importance of abnormal electrocardiographic uh, response um, with normal stress echocardiography among patients undergoing stress echo. And um, what uh, Dr. Velasquez and his team did back then, um, which was actually a few years ago, is that they utilized all the data from the Duke database um, for uh, stress echoes, close to, I think, 48,000 uh, studies. And they compare, um, like they like hit three different categories, abnormal um, echocardiographic response, normal echocardiographic response with abnormal ECG changes, and normal echocardiographic response with um, normal um, ECG response. And what they found is that abnormal ECG changes even in the presence of normal um, echo response is actually associated uh, with worse outcomes. And the composite endpoint was to death, ERMI, um, hospitalization for a single angina or um, coronary vascularization. Um, as you can see on the subgroup analysis, the difference was mostly driven by um, coronary vascularization and uh, hospitalization for a stable angina. And, um, you know, we were discussing among ourselves, me, uh, Phil, and um, Attila, uh, that, you know, that would be so nice to actually try to replicate this and see how, like, this can transform um, in the nuclear world and uh, whether we can do something similar 
with our nuclear database here because you know there is a lot of opportunity and tons of studies over the over the years but you know before we did that we wanted first to go back and see what has been published in the in the past in terms of uh, abnormal ST changes um, with exercise and normal perfusion. And, you know, we were surprised to find out that the data was quite heterogeneous and most of the studies were older. Um, for example, there's, there was one major study from major clinic that was published in 2003. However, when we went back and looked at the data, they actually, the patients that were included, they had, um, they had an exercise spec from 86 to 93, that's 30 to 35 years ago. However, what they found was that patients who actually had ischemic ST changes with exercise, despite normal uh, myocardial perfusion, they, were, they had worse outcomes for one, like major adverse cardiac events in one, two, and three years compared to patients who had, like compared to the general population of patients with normal perfusion. Again, that was with older generation technology, but that was probably the most important study back then. And since that, there were actually a couple of like smaller studies that were published. Um, some of them only with medications, like adenosine or adenosine, uh, some of them with exercise. And actually, some of the most recent small studies didn't really find a difference among patients, uh, between patients who had uh, ischemic acid changes and those who didn't, among patients who had um, normal perfusion. Um, so, you know, in contrary to the stress echo literature, where um, the paper um, by Duke and Dr. Velasquez is kind of a tiebreaker, and so that there is a clear a difference in the outcomes, um, the data was not so clear for um, a nuclear stress test. So our question was, okay, all those um, findings were published a year ago, how about the modern uh, spectra? And this is what we wanted to investigate. So now I'm going to pause for a little bit and I'm going to discuss a, in theory, um, different topic. And I'm going to talk about um, the correlation of calcium score values with nuclear perfusion results and remember why calcium score is so useful. And I'm going to start with two very brief cases. Um, the first one is a 38-year-old um, female with a BMI of 44 and prediabetes, who presents to her primary care appointment with uh, palpitations and possible cardiac, according to the new Cespain um, guidelines at Cespain. Uh, her primary care is concerned, and uh, they refer her for a, um, a nuclear perfusion study. Uh, she feels she would prefer to avoid exercise, so she ends up undergoing a pharmacologic perfusion study with ragadenosine. As you can see, the study is positive with anterior and anterolateral mild to moderate intensity ischemia. However, I can already see my nuclear cardiology attendings uh, looking and figuring out that actually, if you compare the stress with the rest images, there is uh, what we call a sifting breast attenuation artifact. You can see that on the rest images, uh, the left breast overlies the whole left ventricle versus on the stress that it actually overlies only the upper um, one third to um, one half. So this creates um, the artifact. So it was a positive study, but like most likely that was driven by uh, artifact. The patient is referred to a cardiologist and the cardiologist thinks that in general, it's a low, like they, I guess they didn't really buy the results. So they decided first to obtain a coronary CT before, um, uh, before moving to a cath. Um, the coronary CT, which in theory was not a great test for her, her BMI was 44. However, it was good enough to prove that there is no coronary artery disease. So, you know, potentially all this could have been avoided if there were um, two different things at the first stage. First, if attenuation correction had been used in the first study, which was not. Um, and again, all, that, all the data are outside of our health system, um, just to mention that. And second, if we had the calcium score uh, performed at the time of the SPECT, you know, and um, we knew that this, per this person has literally zero calcium, that would probably have made the read um, a little bit different and maybe a little bit more uh, specific, or it would have raised, um, you know, suspicious that maybe that's actually really an artifact. Uh, the second case is a 55-year-old male with hypertension, smoking and with chest pain on exertion for two days. Uh, he undergoes exercise pact, and he's able to exercise for 11 minutes without any ST changes. So um, from the local hospital that he went to in the emergency room, um, they tell him that, you know, your heart looks beautiful, you did fine, and you can go uh, back home, continue uh, your prior lifestyle. He goes home, uh, doesn't really change anything um, in terms of what he's doing, 
After six months, he has mortis pain on exertion. This time he goes to another hospital um, and in the next emergency room, he's actually getting a coronary CT. As you can see, the specs was right. There was no spec was right because there was no ischemia. And we know we can see that the disease was actually not obstructed. There is atherosclerosis. You can see the coronary CT images here in the LED and CERC. However, there is like it's non obstructive atherosclerosis, which was not enough to create any ischemia. So spec was right. However, if at the time of the spec we had a calcium score performed or um, uh, some kind of illustration of the coronaries, we will have noticed that this person actually has atherosclerosis. And the message will be completely different. Inter instead of telling the patient that everything looks fine, we will have told him that, you know, you don't have significant disease yet, but you do have atherosclerosis. And this is obviously totally different in terms of um, medication compliance and uh, risk factor modification. And remember that if someone gets to the point to be referred for a spec, even in the presence of normal perfusion, there are higher chances that this person will have a calcium score more than 400 compared with a calcium score of zero. Again, even among folks who have totally normal perfusion, while 0.6% of patients with um, calcium score of zero will have severe ischemia, and 3.5% of, uh, of those patients will have some ischemia. At the same time, almost 70% of patients with a calcium score more than 400 will have zero ischemia. And in general, um, that's a meta-analysis of different observational studies. All this, like some of these observational studies were retrospective. Some of them um, were actually prospective uh, in terms of design. But all of them, what they did is that they tried to compare perfusion imaging with a calcium score that was performed within a reasonable time period, you know, from a few days to maybe a few months. And what they found is that among patients with normal perfusion and no ischemia on the stress test, um, calcium score, a positive calcium score, like is going to be, to, to be to, we're going to find a positive calcium score in 75% of those, while we're going to find a calcium score more than 400, a uh, severe calcification in 25% of those. And even among patients with normal perfusion, um, the severity of calcium score does matter and it changes the, associ the association that, is, that uh, it changes the risk for uh, major adverse cardiac events. And remember, and we know that for PROMIS, um, it's easier to convince uh, patients to take medications um, when they know that they do have atherosclerosis in the coronary artery. And the interesting thing with PROMIS is that, sure, it, they compared coronary CT versus functional, but remember that in the functional arm, um, six, I think 60% of those patients had um, SPECT CT, uh, sorry, SPECT, but the percentage of, C, of CT performed for attenuation correction in the functional arm was almost zero. So literally nobody really, even among those who had SPECT, nobody really know if these patients had any coronary calcification or atherosclerosis. And the result was that in the post hoc analysis, when they compared the percentage um, of patients that actually became compliant with medications or heard medication changes, the CTR did much better, which makes sense because physicians, providers, and patients, they knew that something was wrong. Um, another benefit of calcium score, as everybody knows, is the warranty period, right? So we can get from three to seven years, depends on the risk factor and the race. And that's a powerful tool that even for someone who is undergoing a spec can be extremely useful. Because when these people, if the spec is normal, when these people come back to the emergency room or to the clinic after a few months or one year or two years with some chest pain and similar symptoms, the providers, but also the patients themselves will feel more comfortable to realize that probably another testing is not needed right now, knowing that they had the calcium score of zero. So it can um, probably decrease the chances that we're going to obtain more testing um, in the future. And this is what I think is one of the uh, most fascinating papers that were published this year in the cardiac imaging world, and it was published by Mark Budoff and um, some other calcium uh, score experts around the country. What they found is that patients who have a calcium score more than 300 actually have the same risk of major adverse cardiac events with patients who are already treated for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So if we put this finding together and also the calcium score of zero finding, plus the compliance with the medications, we understand how important it will be to know, to have information about um, atherosclerosis in patients who undergo um, some kind of perfusion imaging. And, um, you know, 
I'm sure that everybody's thinking by now, you know, is there a way to integrate a non-contrast um, test CT in patients who undergo myocardial perfusion imaging in order to get this calcification information, right? Because it's going to provide us with all this great data that we're discussing the last, uh, the last uh, few minutes. But, you know, we actually do have it. We have, we, like many centers around the country, we have a solution for that, right? And the solution is called CT performed for attenuation correction. So now I'm going to move um, uh, to the next um, bullet point, which is to realize the full capabilities and free data uh, that can be offered by CT used for attenuation correction and understand how, common, how commonly um, it is utilized. So why to use attenuation correction in general? Because it obviously can increase the specificity of a SPECT study. And that's a review paper. They took some significant studies that um, compare the specificity of SPECT before um, and before and after attenuation correction. As you can see, it was much better with, attenu with attenuation correction. In some of the studies, the sensitivity also was better. And, you know, here I get that a lot of people will have concerns and will think about, um, let's say that we're using CT for attenuation correction on top of the SPECT, that's extra radiation. However, what, they, what most studies found is that actually if you integrate the uh, CT performed for attenuation correction, and you are able to do a stress-first protocol, the CT may actually increase, like decrease the chance that you are going to need rest imaging. So in this way, the total amount of radiation, even in this single study, might be reduced. On top of that, as we discussed previously, you may end up doing less um, uh, stress testing and cardiac imaging um, in the future for this patient. So the total amount of radiation will probably go down. Um, now, apart from improving the specificity of a SPECT study, using CT for attenuation correction can provide a number of collateral benefits. And those include, you know, images of all the cardiac timbers and a general idea about anomalies there, um, general idea about the size of the aorta and the pulmonary artery. Again, this is not a gated study, so it comes with limitations. However, we can still obtain useful information. In someone who presents with chest pain in the emergency room, sometimes we may be lucky enough to detect incidental findings like pericardial effusion, pleural effusions, hiatal hernias, or even rib fractures, which might be the reason for the patient's uh, chest pain. Then sometimes we might detect incidental malignancies, right? Which I understand that some of this may actually bring further testing in the future. However, sometimes we're lucky enough to, read, to diagnose us in an early stage and actually save uh, um, the lives of the patients. And finally, we may be able to assess for possible anomalous origin of the coronary arteries. Again, this is limited by the fact that those studies are non-gated. However, we can possibly obtain some basic information. And last but not least, we can look for coronary artery calcification. And when we try to look for coronary artery calcification in a CT performed for attenuation correction, you know, it really depends on the type of the scanner that we're going to use and on... Um, Image B and C, you can actually see images from CT perform for attenuation correction at rest and stress. And um, I think we can all agree that we think there is uh, probably some on um, LAD calcification, probably some uh, serial calcification too. Then when we see the calcium score, same patient, same day, that's the calcium score images, we can see that that was actually an LAD stand. So um, depends on the scanner that we're using for CT perform for attenuation correction, we might not always have great um, uh, accuracy. Um, and it's obviously totally different if we use a four slice scanner for a um, CT perform for attenuation correction version 16, a slice scanner or 64. With 64, our accuracy and our confidence in our data and coronary artery calcification is much, much better. Uh, in general, there is a good correlation between coronary artery calcification as assessed by dedicated calcium core CT and CT uh, for attenuation correction. And the correlation is better for relatively, for calcium score values less than 200. As we go to more than 200, again, there is still a decent correlation, but maybe not as great. However, what remains persistent is that even with CT, like CT scanners that do not have a great quality, even with no, without a 64 scanner, we should be able to tell, to answer a simple question, the, the, the dichotomous easy question, whether there is coronary artery calcification or not, yes or not. Uh, and for that, studies have shown that um, the area under the curve may actually be up to 0.96. And um, this is the way that we assess um, coronary artery calcification from CT 
perform for attenuation correction in the Yale nuclear lab. That's the way that the input um, looks like in Lumedics. And, um, you know, most like wh what we do here is that first we comment on presence or absence of, of calcification. Um, the VA does the same, but the VA, I think they don't, they're not going to comment on specifically the degree of calcification. If I remember correct here, for each individual artery, um, on your report, you will get a specific um, mention about mild, moderate, or severe calcium. And uh, now I'm going to go a few years back again, and I'm going to talk about a paper that was published by our program director, Dr. Miller, on um, um, how CT use for attenuation correction can actually help and change the diagnostic performer, performance of myocardial perfusion imaging. So what they found, they took patients who had spec CT in our healthcare system that later ended up undergoing a coronary angiogram. And what they found is that the positive predictive value of spec in the absence of coronary calcification is 19%, one nine. Contrary to that, the negative predictive value of a negative spec in the presence of coronary artery calcification is 42%. So we can all understand how much of a difference in the positive and negative predictive uh, value of this study make, um, will have made if we have used um, uh, CT uh, used for attenuation correction in order to and have the opportunity to assess the coronary artery calcification. Um, skip that. And then that's more research coming out of our uh, nuclear lab. And that's a paper that the lead author is uh, my mentor for this presentation um, and this whole um, research journey on um, CT use for attenuation correction, Dr. Attila Feher. And what the investigators did here is that, and that's only, not, not only data from our center, but I think it's a multi-site uh, multi uh, study, including patients from uh, Cedar sinai and other centers in the US. Um, they actually found that integrating calcium score assessed by CT use for attenuation correction can help the diagnostic accuracy of spec CT when you compare this diagnostic accuracy com with the diagnostic accuracy from all the traditional risk factors. Um, so in general, it's like, and they actually use a machine learning model for, for the analysis. So in general, the results can only get better. Now, after we discussed all these great things about um, how helpful it can be, the question is, sure, but how frequently do we use attenuation correction in general? And the data regarding that, and again, don't forget that now we're not only talking about major academic centers, but we're talking about the whole country, right? So it's quite disappointing. We're probably using attenuation correction close to 25% of the cases. So 75% of the cases that undergo spec do not get any attenuation correction. And there is a lot of geographical variability, both in the US, but around the world. And as you can see, most of the places around the world, they use persistently less than 50% attenuation correction. Remember, this is data for any type of attenuation correction. The actual CT numbers are much lower. I was not able to find a specific number, neither for the US nor for the rest of the world, but my suspicion is that it's pretty low if we start from a 25% um, utilization of attenuation correction. Now I'm going to move to the last and final goal of my presentation to present our own data and prove to you why I think readers, referring physicians, patients in the healthcare system can only benefit from CT, attenuation correction use in stress, uh, nuclear perfusion imaging. So I think asking the right question was extremely important in uh, what we tried to do. Because initially, you know, when we were brainstorming, right after the presentation of um, the paper by Dr. Velas the paper uh, by the Duke team and Dr. Velasquez, we were thinking that, you know, let's do the same for spec. But this is where the importance of um, good mentorship comes. And Attila, Dr. Faker was suggested back then that, you know, we live in 2022. It makes way more sense to actually study SPECT CT rather than SPECT um, and study how important are ischemic acid changes in modern SPECT CT. So what we did, we utilized years of studies from the Yale Nuclear um, Lab. And in total, there were 34,000 studies from 2016 to 2022. We only used those that had CT performed for attenuation correction. So that was a little bit more than 12,000 studies. We, ex and only, we, we focused only on exercise and regadenosine. We excluded the butamine, we excluded the adenosine. And we only counted, um, we only used one study per patient. So for patients that had multiple studies, we only used the first one. Um, obviously that was a retrospective design. Uh, for the coronary artery calcification, 
what we did is that we decided to handle that in an easy to use, simple way, the Hotmush way, yes, presence or no absence. And we thought that that might be better in terms of avoiding the, um, you know, grading mild, moderate, severe sometimes can be subjective. Um, second, it will be easier to, to be used in everyday clinical practice because even as I mentioned previously, even if your scanner is not like high quality, the, the scanner that you're using for CTAC, you should still be able to tell whether there is coronary artery calcification or not. And then we do the same thing for ischemic EKG changes. And we performed a multivariate analysis for the three-year composite endpoint of MI, death, or revascularization. Uh, in total, with an equal representation of female close to 47%, and um, our average BMI was 20, 29, which you will think that it makes a lot of sense, given that all those were spec studies and uh, we ex excluded PET. Uh, most of our studies, close to 60% were adenosine and 40% with, um, with exercise. In total, 70% of our patient population had any type of coronary artery calcification. And on the multi, and all this is unpublished data that we hope to submit in the next few days. On the multivariate Cox regression analysis for the three-year composite endpoint, again, death, MI, or revascularization, we found that among all patients, both coronary artery calcification, but also ischemic ECG changes with exercise, they are associated with horse outcomes. However, when we restricted the analysis to the main goal of our paper, which was to look at patients with normal refusion, what we found is that coronary artery calcification maintained its significance with a hazard ratio close to three. However, abnormal EKG, meaning ischemic EKG changes with exercise, did not matter in that group. And here you can see the couple of male survival curves that, that we created for um, different ways to categorize um, our analysis, abnormal versus normal perfusion, uh, presence or absence of ischemic EKG changes, and presence or absence of coronary artery calcification. And that's actually the main figure of our, of our manuscript. Where, what we did is that we compared patients with abnormal perfusion, which as you can see, they did way worse than anybody else. And then among folks with normal perfusion, we created four different subgroups. No EKG changes and no calcification. EKG changes with, without calcification. No, um, then EKG changes with calcification and calcification without EKG changes. Once again, what we found is that calcification is associated with worse outcomes. However, among patients who have calcification, presence or absence of EKT changes did not matter in terms of the three-year composite endpoint. Similarly, among patients without calcification, presence or absence of EKT changes did not matter. And we confirmed all those findings in subgroup analysis based on exercise and drug adenosine. And um, in subgroup, and we also performed a landmark analysis after excluding the first 90 days to make sure that our results are not driven by early um, revascularization. Um, and all those subgroup and sensitivity analysis confirmed our main uh, findings. So the conclusions of our work so far, um, the presence of coronary artery calcification was associated with adverse outcomes, independently of ischemic uh, EKG changes in patients with normal perfusion. Presence of ischemic ECG changes in patients with normal perfusion was not correlated um, with um, the composite endpoint, the three-year composite endpoint, when adjusted for coronary artery calcification. So, Coronary artery calcification obtained by CTAC may actually be useful in order to further risk stratify the cardiovascular risk of patients who undergo SPECT and have a normal uh, perfusion imaging study. Uh, future directions, um, we think that it's reasonable to try in the future to use persistently CTAC in order to provide coronary artery um, CA, calcium score quantification, which most centers, like almost no centers in the country do right now for different reasons. We should try to integrate CTAC in as many spec scanners as possible. And last but not least, should we start thinking in the future, since we know that there is a proven benefit for using CT for attenuation correction in terms of less radiation, uh, less cost for the healthcare system, better for the patient, better for the physician. Uh, should we start thinking about linking the presence of CTAC with SPECT um, reimbursement for different hospitals and imaging centers? Um, I would like to thank Dr. Attila Fecher once again. Um, it was a great experience for me. He was an amazing mentor from day one when he was still an advanced, ima advanced imaging fellow until now. And um, he, helped, he helped me asking all the right questions. Um, he helped me like analyzing um, 
the data in the right way and um, uh, it, was, it was really amazing. I would also like to thank um, Dr. Miller, uh, Dr. Velasquez that we built our work based on their prior work, um, Dr. Sinusos and all the other nuclear lab uh, faculty, um, uh, physicians and um, scientists uh, that um, were extremely helpful in all this process. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions now or later. Thank you. Morning. Um, in a nod to the millennials, I'll use my phone to uh, introduce, but of course I have to use my glasses. <laughs> um, so Ricardo uh, graduated from medical school at the Universidad Dr. Jose Mateus Delgado in El Salvador. Um, but then he came to the United States and uh, did his internal medicine at the Jacoby Medical Center. Uh, we were able to recruit him then uh, to Yale for uh, the T32 uh, where he worked, uh, Grant, where he worked with Dr. Sinousis, uh, and then do his clinical fellowship uh, here. In Dr. Sinousis' lab, he worked on multimodality imaging, arrhythmogenesis uh, with nuclear imaging, and the impact of hydrogels on left ventricular uh, remodeling. Um, and we've been fortunate to, to keep our grip on him uh, and keep him here uh, for his electrophysiology fellowship. Uh, on a personal note, I'm going to say, I mean, as we all know, Ricardo is uh, an excellent uh, clinical fellow. He's uh, been very dedicated uh, and has great uh, clinical acumen. Uh, and I just have to say, like a few times during his fellowship, he's come to me and said, you know, he's been really interested in doing something in El Salvador uh, for global health. Uh, but, you know, as all of us, he's, he's a clinical fellow. All of us have these a lot of opportunities. So we can only choose some. Uh, but he came uh, just a few weeks ago and with a little bit more enthusiasm than usual, said he really wants to do something. And I've never seen somebody come out of the gate so quickly uh, in terms of showing an interest, you know, uh, developing a proposal and talking to all the key players, both here uh, in El Salvador. So I'll let uh, him uh, tell you what, what he has in mind. Um. <clears throat> Um, yeah, well, thank you so much for uh, your kind introduction, Dr. McNamara. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, and today, I, I would like to talk to you about a project that I've been working over the past few months. And, and as Dr. McNamara said, I came to him some, um, you know, like a month ago with this idea. And I'm really happy that he's able to sponsor. Um, so, and this is the implementation of a cardiovascular educational program in El Salvador. Um, but first, I want to convince you that there's, is, there's an importance in actually doing global health and the, in, also the, the link of economics and cardiovascular burden, my personal motivation, and I'm going to go over the project itself. So for those who are not familiar where El Salvador is actually located, it's, you know, in Central America, um, neighbors Guatemala, Honduras, uh, North Nicaragua and uh, we're near the Pacific. You know, it's a beautiful place to live and be raised there. Uh, we have about six to seven million Salvadorians and you know, it's, it's of the size of New Jersey, uh, roughly. But besides being beautiful, there's a big problem. And that problem is that of, of poverty, you know, um, based on data from the World Bank, 30% uh, of the population is still living less than $6 per day. Um, and even though there has been improvements over the past um, decade, um, you know, we're, we're not there yet. Um, and that has been postulated to be associated with many, many issues. But one of them is the fact that we have just had a modest grown in GDP, as you can see from the line on yellow to the right. Uh, we have only had maybe two instances over the past two, 20 years in where the GDP has grown more than 3%. Um, and of course, you know, poverty leads to many, many things. But the three key uh, problems in El Salvador, I believe, are related to inequality. Uh, of income, uh, inequality of quality of life, and also uh, there's not an economic and uh, well-being of, of the nation. And this leads to uh, forced migration, like myself, for example, and also violence, gangs, and, and crime. So how is that cardiovascular disease actually plays a role? Um, so as you can imagine, there's always a scarcity of data. 
And this is the most recent data that I could find from El Salvador that basically was really important because the National Institute of Health reported at the time that it was the first time in history that uh, the most common cause of death in El Salvador uh, following, unfortunately, gun violence was not communicable diseases, but instead it was uh, um, non-communicable diseases, which epide epidemiology is called the transition of these uh, two entities. Uh, and of those, as you can see here, um, you know, the most common cause of this non-communicable diseases was cardiovascular disease with ischemic heart disease being on top of it. Uh, at the time they projected, in fact, that this was only going to get worse. And in fact, it has, you know, even though we don't have any recent data, um, based on a recent report from Jack of last year, uh, in where they reported the global burden of the disease, they reported that in Central Latin America, as they call it here, um, the most common cause of disability related to adjust to, uh, to uh, cardiovascular, I'm sorry, that just a disability in terms of a condition, uh, it was related to um, ischemic heart disease, which is a trend that has been um, all over the world, particularly in the developing countries. So what is the importance of this? Uh, well, the importance is the fact that um, cardiovascular disease burden plays a significant role in, in, in particularly in low to middle income countries. Um, just to give you an example of how this impact uh, plays a role in El Salvador, uh, the total GDP of El Salvador last year was almost $29 billion. And um, there's a typo there, but in 2022, the healthcare budget was roughly 10% which equates to $2.5 billion. And of that, based on an estimates from the WHO, they report that the, the cost of cardiovascular disease treatment, it's, a, it's about 9% of the budget of healthcare, which is, is somewhere around the $230 million, which you know, to the US, that might not be a lot of money, but for countries like El Salvador, that seems to be a lot. And the problem is that this is not being invested in prevention, but more so in treatment. Um, so, but at the same time, there's an opportunity. Why? Because there's some economic models that reports that um, once you have um, investment in healthcare, particularly in preventive measures, you can actually have a GDP boost. Um, and it has been estimated that for every dollar that you invest in healthcare, particularly in prevention, preventive measures, you can actually get two to fourfold um, GDP boost in, its, in, in these countries. So my idea is that, you know, for example, if you could relocate these funds that are delivered to treatment of uh, cardiovascular disease in the preventive measure, you can actually have long-term uh, benefits. Um, so this leads, so now I have made the case that, that you know, there's, a, there's an association between uh, the burden of cardiovascular disease in low to middle income countries and um, the economy of, if, of, of El Salvador, for example. And so what are the benefits of global health initiatives? There's many have, have postulated different things, but I would summarize in three. First, it improves economic well-being of the nations. Um, this actually becomes a, a circle in where you can actually decrease inequality, and this will eventually decrease migration, and then countries are going to become more sustainable, and you know everyone's going to be happier. You know that's kind of like the whole mo notion of, of global health. Uh, in countries like the United States, there's also a, a moral responsibility because we're the, you know, this is the wealthiest country in, in the world. Personally, for me, you know, of course I'm biased, you know, I'm from El Salvador, but um, I, I, I'll show you my path in the sense on how it has shaped me in the way that I have become more motivated um, later. But uh, always, you know, people get to ask me like, why do you actually migrate? You know, why do you come? So, so it's, it's really complex, you know, many have postulated different things, but in my case, it was really easy. I didn't find the educational opportunities that I wanted, but I'm not alone. Just according to the World Bank, there, was, uh, there were 1.5 million Salvadorans that actually left El Salvador from 2013 to 2027, and 84% of those actually came to the United States for different reasons, including gangs, violence, you know, persecution, and some like myself, you know, because of education. So this is my path, uh, what I have done. Um, you know, I finished high school and I went to this hospital, which is Hospital Nacional San Rafael, small secondary center. And, I, and there I, I faced challenges of not having things to, to give or offer to my patients. You know, typical answers were like, you know, there's nothing we can do. You know, they, that was typical. 
Um, but it was not until I became uh, a rep for a major uh, biomedical company in where I realized that I had access to healthcare, but unfortunately, only a few you know, patients were able to afford these technologies. And this picture is really important for me because I am there doing some you know, techs for this company. And you know, this is an American electrophysiologist coming to El Salvador to do a medical mission. And at the time, I remember <clears throat> should be that person. You know, I, I should be helping, not the other way around. Um, and that led me to actually come to the United States um, to pursue further training. And, and I have to stop here just to acknowledge um, two doctors that actually were instrumental in, in helping me where I am right now, <clears throat> that I basically reached out to them and they opened the doors for me to actually enter the system. Um, this is Dr. Gidwane, who is the head of the CCO at Sinai, and Dr. Godsey, who is an attending at Sinai as well. Um, and they sponsored me, you know, and I, after that, I was able to go to Jacobi and where I got amazing training. Um, and it was great because I was able to see the treatment of underserved communities in the Bronx as well. So it reminded me also like El Salvador, you know. Um, but then, you know, I was able to come to Yale for my training and my time here has been amazing. I, I would say that I've been able, you know, besides my clinical fellowship, you know, and to continue my career in electrophysiology, I've been able to work on two different spheres as well. One is research, as Dr. Uh, McNamara mentioned, I have been a really fortunate to work with Dr. Sinusas to understand the, the foundations of research, uh, having a project from zero to completion and understanding multimodality imaging in a different uh, sphere. And also in leadership, uh, I think this is a really good skill by working with the leadership in the program. <clears throat> and also I became a co-chair of the trainee recruitment committee uh, for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. So as you can see, all of these experiences are not perfectly straight, but they have allowed me to grow in a sense that I be have become inspired by work that has been done by Dr. McNamara, for example, Dr. Haynes or Dr. Lombo, in where you know you have people from other countries that they go to underserved communities and they try to, to help. So I said to myself, why not me? You know, why is that I have to wait until I'm done to actually do something? So because of this, I said, okay, uh, let's start from uh, to, to see or see the diagnosis of the, the, the situation in El Salvador. So over the past few months, I have been um, in different talks with people in the government, uh, with uh, NGOs, um, organizations, or with also with private companies and, 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 and industry, just to get a sense of what, what, what is the need. And as you can imagine, the need is, is, is huge, but I can summarize it in, in four points. Um, first, there's not a clear public policy um, in, about the threat of cardiovascular disease. You know, unfortunately, because of this epidemiological transition um, has happened so quickly, you know, most of the, of the policies were given to primary care uh, and communicable diseases. And still, there's not a, a, a clear policy to treat cardiovascular disease. Um, the cardiology workforce is really small, as you can see, 60 to 70 cardiologists for a six to seven million people in, in El Salvador. So most of the care is being delivered by primary care in the way of integrated healthcare delivery networks. Um, and there's no formal cardiovascular training in the country. And although the universal healthcare system is the goal, uh, the healthcare is still fragmented in different sections that I'm not gonna go into today. But, uh, and lastly, there's a really big challenge to get access to healthcare, particularly to advanced technologies. So I believe that in order for me to help, I, I think that there should be, or I should promote sustainable innovation, education and prosperity and reduction in poverty by decreasing healthcare expenditure as a result of decreasing the um, cardiovascular disease burden in El Salvador. That's kind of like my goal, okay? Um, and I believe also that the ideal structure of a program should be one that has a foundation in education that can provide access to healthcare and lastly, that is sustainable. So then I can have a better impact overall. Um, so with this, I drafted a proposal and I spoke with Dr. McNamara and I, I, and I said, okay, um, first I need to identify the key players down there. And, um, I, and after speaking with the assistant of the Minister of Health, I, I got a sense that this was actually something that could be actually done. Um, so the main objective of this collaboration is that um, we are going to partner with the Minister of Health in El Salvador. I teach with this, the nonprofit that Dr. Mark uh, and others founded uh, some years ago, 
to improve knowledge on cardiovascular disease uh, to local physicians, patients and nurses, and everyone who takes care of, of, of um, patients in El Salvador. Uh, um, and the goal to, is to establish a longitudinal relationship uh, in three main areas. One is health promotion and prevention of the disease, because we know that these measures actually have a potential benefit uh, in economics down the line. And then focus training, because after the pandemic, they invested a lot of money into emergency uh, training, and now they have developed emergency medical residencies. So I, I thought that this was a really good fit. And, and lastly, uh, the early detection of neglected diseases, uh, such as Chagas cardiomyopathy in high prevalence areas. So I'm, I'm happy to announce that on March of next year, we're actually gonna go down there and, and do the first mission. Um, I would say that, um, you know, we're, we're constantly having meetings with the minister, uh, just so then we can uh, shape the project that better serves the needs of the local uh, physicians. But I'm just going to go over what uh, this organogram uh, shows. But in, in general, the, the Minister of Health is the main entity in El Salvador. And then we're going to have the help of the National Institute of Health from El Salvador. That is the entity that is profiled to be like an equivalent of, of the NIH uh, here that are trying to generate research and evidence to promote uh, evidence-based medicine. And also with my former medical school, because thankfully I know the dean and we, they are interested in improving the curricula of the students down in El Salvador as well. Um, just to give you some data as well, the Ministry of Health is responsible for 70% of uh, you know, healthcare in the population. They have these integrated delivery networks that um, we believe are gonna be able to generate more impact with our intervention. Um, and also because they are in charge of the education of the residents in the public health system, like I was once, you know, before, like 10 years ago. Uh, as I said, and, and the National Institute of Health from El Salvador is a subdivision of the government, and they are positioned, they have positions themselves to do partnerships with uh, uh, NGOs or governments around the, the world. And with my former medical school, because they would serve as a local uh, experts, for example, in POCUS, or uh, they will start to develop first a different curricula for their students. So the pilot project is going to be on March, you know, March meaning the visit, but actually we're going to start to work even beforehand because the project is going to be a hybrid project and where we're going to do um, a series of cardiovascular prevention lectures, okay, uh, with the objective of, uh, you know, having pr prevention and promotion of, the, of health based on the modifiable risk factors according to the global burden of the disease metrics. And for this, we're going to use something that's called the Project ECHO, which I'm going to expand a little bit on the next slide. Uh, this is going to be mainly aimed to primary care and subspecialty physicians. Um, and it's going to be a case-based discussion with lecture series that could be repeated every academic year. And we're going to, of course, assess the impact of the intervention. And we hope to generate a longitudinal relationship with the trainees. So what is Project ECHO? This is a platform, virtual platform that was created like 20 years ago by the University of New Mexico. And that, that was created in, um, initially as a part of an effort to uh, promote health in underserved areas in New Mexico. Uh, so, and, and this was actually before the pandemic. So it's just basically like a virtual platform in where uh, many physicians from different levels of care can actually log in and discuss cases based on a specific topics with experts from all over the world. Um, and the goal is to amplify and reduce disparities and monitor out some outcomes of impact and, of course, to engage. And El Salvador participates as a part of the Latin America coll collaborative. And also the other project that we're going to do concomitantly is focus training. As I said in, before, we have or we are going to identify a specific physicians that are going to be able to continue to train others uh, while we're gone, we're gone. so then uh, this could be perpetuated over time. And the goal is to actually have a, a series of virtual lectures before our visit. Um, and in the meantime, like from today, or, uh, we are continuing to have meetings with, the, with people there, but um, we're going to, to identify a specific physicians that we would like to train. Um, and we're going to actually uh, touch base with them every three to four months and we're going to have a local champion so then we can or they can assess the the skills uh the physical skills every now and then uh in a quarter quarterly manner or, or every three months or so and we're going to do a simulation uh training in the sim lab of the national institute of health as well 
Um, and lastly, you know, uh, this is kind of like my, you know, my personal goals, you know, uh, even if I end up here or going somewhere else, but uh, basically I think that this type of mentorships uh, with uh, institutions like, like Yale or I teach, you know, as a nonprofit, you can do many things. And uh, the, the, the way I see this is that you can actually start doing uh, research. You know, I think that the Institute of Health in El Salvador is really well positioned to even do registries or collaborations, have some impact in the level of local guidelines, public awareness campaign, digital health. I think it could play a big role here. Uh, mentorship, you know, just to facilitate opportunities for uh, inter international students. So then they could come and they can go and teach others as well. Um, and education, which I think is the core of the program, just is starting to change the curriculum of different medical schools uh, with my former medical school being the first one, I think this could be a good start. Um, and lastly, who, you know, maybe who says that we cannot start even a, a fellowship program there, that'll be amazing. And then lastly, as a, an electro, future electrophysiologist, I would say that um, there are only three P's in the country, um, you know, and the need is huge, you know, you know, many patients with Chagas that they need pacemakers and they don't have, they don't have money to afford it. So I'm just thinking of how to, to make an impact. And I think that this is the, a good first step. Um, so this is all I have. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. And I, you know, I, I want to thank uh, before I say, uh, Dr. McNamara, Dr. Lombo, Dr. Haynes, because they have done such an amazing job in, in global health. You know, Dr. Haynes has done great in Haiti, and we're using her platform in iCards uh, that she used to teach others in Haiti to promote education. Uh, so she's going to be really uh, great for us as well, and uh, Dr. Lombo as well. And then I would like to thank Dr. Miller and Dr. Gandhi for all of the uh, you know, support during the clinical fellowship. Dr. Sinusas, uh, because of my time at Whitrick, was great. Um, and Dr. Enriquez, Enriquez and Freeman for recruiting me to EP. Thank you so much. First of all, congratulations to both of you for really outstanding presentations. I mean, I think it, it's clear that you've, you've uh, um, uh, not only taken advantage of the opportunities that are available here, but you've grown through a process. And it's really, to me, very energizing to see um, um, how you've taken advantage of, of the opportunities, even if uh, the last three years were a little bit different in terms of the world's uh, response to a pandemic uh, than we expected when we, when we got into it. A couple of questions just briefly for each of you. I mean, I'll start um, with uh, Damianos. Um, you know, I, I think the work you showed really pr provides, um, you know, a lot of food for thought about how we can evaluate uh, in real time new technologies and then put them into practice. So um, maybe a quick question. So have you, um, do you have any guidance on um, the, the, uh, the pathways that, and the reporting infrastructure for how we now are going to incorporate CTAC um, results. In other words, do we now have a systematic kind of um, reporting uh, kind of summary that you know this person has no calcium, you know, it's okay to continue with current uh, follow-up versus this patient has positive uh, calcium and a we should suggest a referral to cardiovascular prevention and or uh, cardiovascular follow-up uh, for consideration of ASCVD treatment or something like that. I mean, how are we gonna test the implementation of that and how are we gonna monitor it? And do we know how well we're doing right now? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think it will be really great if we can actually um, create a way so that in our report, we will be able to provide some recommendations. Um, you know, I always keep in mind that Sure, many of those reports, they go to cardiologists, they go to some of us, um, and um, immediately when we see the calcification information, we understand 100% what that means and the implications. But many of those tests are not ordered by cardiologists. And I think he, there, there is a big like lost opportunity. You know, patients that are uh, may, that, you know, people maybe do not realize what um, the calcification information means. So I think if we can find a way system-wide system -wide to uh, flag those cases that have normal perfusion and 
but however, they do have calcification so that people will know that those folks, they do have atherosclerosis and that they should be treated for that. Um, I'm not really sure what's the best way to do that um, in terms of, you know, um, integrate that in the report or flag it on EPIC or educate the referring uh, physicians. But um, I think by doing that, we're going to be able to uh, start treating a lot of those patients earlier and avoid further testing as well. Thank you. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Really, um, you know, I, I, uh, congratulations for diving in, and, and I think the impact will be uh, uh, um, will be important, and, and and it will take time. I can tell you that, uh, with, in my own experience in global health, you know, it's a it's a it's a it's a long game you're playing, right? You know, it's a you know we were opening a cath lab after 15, 15 years later after I said we were going to open the cath lab uh, in the Kenya program that I initiated. Yeah. 2008. Um, and so uh, I, I, first of all, congratulate you for this work. Um, and I, I encourage um, you to kind of start building um, opportunities for, for scholarship within that uh, program. I, I just wanted to throw out another example of, I mean, I have a lot of ideas today, but, you know, uh, Evan and Rohan have built beautiful pro, um, data regarding AI evaluation of ECGs um, uh, to understand you know, whether someone has a risk of heart failure based on the ECG that's an image, wouldn't it be wonderful to actually test the implementation direct the POCUS exams um, as, as a, maybe an initial step of building on each other's work. And, um, but really just again, congratulations and, and thank you for, for doing this. Great job. I have a question for Damianos, and that's related to actually the where you looked at the uh, EKG abnormality and calcium scoring and was not independently associated. Yeah. I wonder, actually, you didn't, I, I may not have understood it, but you may not have done this, that there may be actually a correlation between EKG changes and calcium score. That's why even you adjust the effect all the way. And that can actually have implications because one of your patients actually had chest pain, went on and had another stress test and had calcium but it was not obstructed, which can suggest that maybe there's endothelial dysfunction that the EKG can detect. And having, you know, it has implication because not every place has calcium kind of uh, CT, you know, CT correction. So I wonder if you look at it to see actually those people who have abnormal EKG, actually they are the ones that should more have calcium scoring positive hypothesis. That case you don't have to reject those buses kind of hypothesis and stay more higher tier. <laughs> Um, yeah, so among patients who had um, ischemic ST changes, uh, presence of coronary artery calcification was more common. Um, and, you know, I think the message of our um, analysis so far is definitely, it's not that we should ignore the AKG changes, you know, contrary to that, we think AKG changes are extremely important and we will, um, we should keep paying attention to that. You know, there is a possibility that either our um, follow-up was not, you know, long enough to see the differences in terms of like longer outcomes or that um, there were probably outcomes that we didn't study yet might be associated with um, even in the adjusted analysis with uh, EKG changes. Um, so, you know, I think it's a work in progress. I think figuring out the best way to um, handle both of these data and maybe and um, knowing how important each one of this um, is going to be in the future um, will be the ideal. Yes. Yes, there is there is higher percentage of calcification, one hundred percent. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So again, congratulations to both of you. Um, wonderful work, wonderful fellowships. Um, for Damianos, uh, you know, we, we always try to put patients into categories, and a lot of the. The clinical data are essentially grouped epidemiologic data. And, and so you've described ECG changes and perfusion abnormalities and fact scoring um, and, you know, how some go together, some don't. And it, 
I can't help but think that number one, there, there, there might be a different or a distinct clinical pathology that drives the abnormalities in each of those. And when you get to personalized issues of an individual patient, we're going to need to have something more than this grouping data because a single patient can easily fall out of that group. Um, and I don't know if you have any thoughts about that in terms of, you know, the, the clinical pathology for each abnormality and what that might make us believe or think about a patient. Um, we're, we're having a visitor tomorrow who is a faculty recruit who's doing what's called proteogenomics or genomo, yeah, proteogenomics basically on single cells to get really a lot of information about what a patient's course might look like depending on their you know, gene expression or protein profile. And I, I, I wonder if you have any thoughts about these different results and how sometimes they go together and sometimes they don't. What does that mean about a patient? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Bender. Um, you know, to be honest, uh, from our analysis, we were not able to detect uh, phenotype changes between um, um, the different uh, possible combinations. However, I do think that there are, and I do think that by uh, using uh, probably some advanced AI models, and um, as you said, you know, proteomics, uh, uh, genomics, or uh, anything that we can actually use to individualize and find out for each individual patient what um, what all these different stress test results really tell us will be the way for the future. Um, I think that's probably separate analysis and that will be super interesting to do and trying to actually even uh, split the different patients to different phenotypes and see for which of them based on their uh, predefined risk factors that we can or we cannot realize without the help of AI sometimes um, how um, the importance of ST changes or coronary artery calcification may differ for each one of those uh, subgroups. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Rathmane. Yeah. 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 We're done with this.